And when people talk, when I talk, I usually say, can you hear me? And they say yes, and I said, then I say, then why don't you listen? <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for gathering with us, whether you're here in person at 347 Fairview Drive in Brantford, Ontario here, or whether you're joining us online from uh, virtually anywhere in the world, we welcome you today for gathering with us. Before we start our service, and I, I uh, lead us in prayer, just to want to lay out a bit of a map of what's going to be happening in the next few weeks, so we're all familiar with that. Uh, there's going to be some work going on at the church here in the next um, month or six weeks towards renovation, uh, particularly in the sanctuary here where you'll notice the most. We're likely going to be changing the seating to from pews to seats, to, similar to what's uh, he, here already. Potent, potentially even service that we have there. That, sorry, potentially tables that we have to go with them, but that's not been definite. There's also, uh, how we'll still be Bran Branford Church of Nazarene is our official name, but we're looking at rebranding for, for the relaunch starting on May the 1st, so there'll be discussion about that in the coming weeks, we, we can prepare for that. But this, as Lorene pointed out for me this morning, this is my last official day as a full-time pastor. The, when we finish here, we'll, we will go down to part-time work as we do that. Now, you can't get rid of us that quick, though. <laughs> it's not going to happen that quick because we are going to be on holiday time next week. But then for each of the Sundays in April, Pastor Andrew will start on April the 1st. And so then on April the 3rd, Pastor Steve Otley, our district superintendent, will be here with us. And I'll be here. And we will install Pastor Andrew as your pastor. And then I will be here to preach... Uh, each of the Sundays after that in April while well, Pastor Andrew uh, starts connecting and starts preparing for the relaunch on May the 1st. So that's kind of a, a roadmap of where we're headed in the next com coming weeks. You're going to see some things physically different. You're going to see th some things uh, different in other ways in the way we, we do things too. So be prepared for that and look forward to it with expectation and for the Lord to lead us in that. This morning I will be preaching from the latter half of Ephesians chapter 4. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jack Matheson spoke from the first half of Ephesians chapter 4 when he talked about the body being in unity together and the different aspects that we need to have with that, of the body working together and being together, that we need unity together. But we need it as individuals, we need it collectively together. And so as we gather now, whether it be here as we gather in the physical building or whether it be with us online, we know that the Spirit is with us, and the, the, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to worship in truth and spirit. The truth of the Word of God and the Spirit of God that binds us together. So let us join our hearts in prayer as we prepare to worship this morning. Father, as we come today, we thank you that you have brought us together, whether it be online, whether it be uh, here in person. We thank you for the... Uh, restrictions that are being lifted and even next week we look forward to is, is the time that we can uh, take our masks off. There's a part of us I know that feels that like last week when we set the clocks forward one hour today can we just set them forward one day uh, and be done with the mask but Father I pray that in this time that, that there would still be wise decisions that are made that there's still, still be uh, Father it's, as we were taught by Jesus to pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as we progress into this coming weeks and coming months, Father, we, we pray that as, as your Bible says, your word says to us, that the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So Father, we pray that you would direct every step that we have, that even though we plan what we will do, that Father, if your will is something different than that, that you guide us in it. And so Father, as we gather together to worship now, would you be honored, would you be praised through the name of Jesus, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning, 
It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love. And you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Oh, Lord. My shepherd, you make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by the still waters. You restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing. For you are with me, and you comfort me. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Oh, Lord, you're my shepherd. You make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by the still waters. You restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing. For you are with me, God, and you comfort me. You comfort me, and surely goodness, love, and mercy 
will follow wherever I go. And surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. Singing that traditionally, I'd go go to a time of prayer. But you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to take us back a few years. Has someone got a testimony of the faithfulness of God? We've just sung of the great faithfulness of God. What is a testimony that you can share? Some, some an account you can share of the faithfulness of God that you've experienced recently. So we haven't experienced the faithfulness of God. We'll go here here first, and then back to Jackie. Just just before you start, Pat, when I repeat you, it's not so that I don't hear you, but so that everybody hears you and they can hear what you're saying online. So go ahead, Pat. Years ago, our oldest daughter um, tried inside and tried to
Pat giving thanks for the faithfulness of God and great is his faithfulness because her daughter who could not conceive after time of prayer was able to conceive. Jackie? Amen. Jackie giving thanks, not for a particular event, but for God's faithfulness every single day. And especially over view as we have experienced over this last two years. Do you know, I, I came to a conclusion that I started here with your interim pastor on the first week that we started the pandemic shutdowns and things like that. And I'm about to clear out at the last of it. Yeah. Thanks for leaving. Thanks for leaving. <laughs> I shouldn't say I'm about to leave at the end of it. You're about to kick me out at the end of it. No. No. Amen. Thank you, sister. Faithfulness in sustaining health, even in the midst of health problems, God is faithful in those. Jack, did you? This goes a long way, a long time ago, when I was 9 or 10, we used to go out west and we were driving through the Rockies in the old 1950 Mercury. Anybody who's old enough may know that they tend to make a lot. In the gradient curve that was an optical illusion, that's what you told the police and you stuck to that story? <laughs> what I did say is my dad actually stuck his leg out in front of the bus driver to try to stop the car. Okay. It, 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 it just went right over his leg. Okay. Jack giving Thanksgiving for a car problem situation many years ago where God's faithfulness and the sign he showed of that afterwards. Anyone else? Tommy? I'm thankful that God picked the wretch like me, Tommy says, and every one of us. One church I served in, a, a gentleman, no matter what testimony he gave, he always began it with, I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of God. And do you know what? Each and every one of us is just a sinner saved by the grace of God. Two more. David. Leading him through the end of dark days. Amen. 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 Thank you, Edna. 
thankful for the doctors in her life and how the Lord has provided for that for her. Do you know we have so much to be, oh, Tabitha, don't let me stop you. Thank you, Tabitha, just sharing a testimony of how the Lord blesses us and is faithful to us who are giving to us and our ability to give to others as he would lead. Do you know, we've got so much to be thankful for and we look to other places in the world, especially the Ukraine, and we see what's going on there. I have a friend who uh, recently got married to a, a girl that moved to, from Texas to Ukraine when she was 13 years old with her family as a, as a missionary kid. And she's lived there for 30 years, and she's fairly well known in the country as a singer. And they got married about three years ago, and she's, she's back in the States here now living with him. And they have uh, daily contact with people in the Ukraine. And do you know what? Even in the mess they're in in the Ukraine, the attack that they're in, do you know what the overwhelming theme is for those people? Thanksgiving to God for how he's protecting them as much as he's protect, protecting them and providing for them when they need to be provided for. So even in the midst of our challenges, even in the midst of the difficulties that we have in life, God is faithful. Great is thy faithful. Jeff, could we sing that again, please? All of this is unscripted. <laughs> and you're leading it, not me. <laughs> Sounds good. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness. with mine in prayer. Father, indeed, you are faithful to us. There is so much in this world that we can't trust even. What is truth anymore? What is truth? The only truth is in your word that we have, that we can truly trust in. Because there's all forms of what people call truth, and there's false truth, there's out, lies out there that people are calling truth. But Father, we trust in you and thank you for being faithful to us. Thank you that no matter how far we, we wander from you, you pursue us. How far we wander from you, you are faithful to us. You do not give up on us. You are there for us. So, Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could open a Bible to the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to start our reading in a few minutes in the verse, at verse 17. Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17. I have had the privilege of living in four countries. I was born in Canada. As a teenager, I moved to England. Then we moved to the United States, and 
10 years ago, we moved to Thailand for a six year period of time there. I've also had the opportunity to visit at least three other countries. I visited Turkey, Kuwait, and China, and I've traveled through at least six other countries, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, Germany, and Dubai, and I considered Hong Kong is separate from, from uh, China because most of the people there do, do as well. But in, in addition to getting knowing the people and their culture, one thing I like, I've appreciated about living in different places and traveling to different places is not only the opportunity to learn about different cultures, but to understand what those people think of us, think of me, think of Canada, think of a Canadian. Most people around the world have a favorable view of Canadians. I pretty well everywhere I've got think we say A a lot, which is understandable because you know how we got our name, don't you? Somebody, when the founding of the country, someone took a Scrabble game and they put all the letter tile chips in, the, in a bag and he pulls out the letter C, A, N, A, C, A, and we get the name Canada. But pretty well everywhere I've gone in the world feels that we say A a lot. When I lived in England as a teen, most people thought because of the accent, even though it is different than America, they figured I was an American and treated me respectfully for the most part, like were friendly to me. But when they found out it was, I was a Canadian, it was a completely different story. They were really uh, almost affectionate towards Canadians. I can remember in 2005, Lynn and I went for a, a tour of Turkey and when we were in Turkey, one, one of the days we went to a place called Cappadocia. You may know it better as Cappadocia. We were in Cappadocia and they let us off the tour bus and they said, what we want you to do is go and meet the villagers. You just go and meet the villagers and try and learn. Out. So we, we met the villagers and our 10 words of Turkish and their 10 words of English. You could be amazed with a pen and paper and pictures where you could communicate with each other. And the, the gentleman that we were talking to, Abraham, or Abraham as would be known in the anglicized version of it, he, he, he asked us if we've always lived in the same place. And I told him, exact, actually I live about 3,000 kilometers from where I was born. Now he didn't even imagine that. He couldn't imagine 3,000 kilometers away for something. And so as we were drawing pictures, I, I indicated to him that the turkey was about the size of Texas. And as soon as we said Texas, you oh, Texas, Texas, cowboy, right? right? <laughs> yeah, Texas cowboy. The things you could communicate when you did that. Well, as we got talking, I drew a map kind of of Canada and showed that I was born in Nova Scotia, but now lived in Toronto. And as soon as we said Canada, oh, Canadian, we like Americans. We love Canadians. <laughs> a whole different attitude towards the area. When I was in Kuwait, I, under, I found out that the people from Kuwait in general, they like America for what they've done for them, but they don't like Americans. They like America, but they don't like Americans. When Lorene and I moved to the United States in, 2000, in the, the year 2000, we, we lived there and, and have a home there now even, in Niagara Falls, New York, and we found that many of the people that we ran into in the, and we met in the area, they had a better than normal understanding of, than America does of Canada. They, they were probably the most, uh, the, the most knowledgeable of what it means to be a Canadian. Now something I learned, and I, I, I've learned through going other places, we as Canadians are very polite people. We're apologetic people. We say sorry a lot. Did you know if Canada took over the whole world and all the people in the world became Canadians, then everybody would be sorry? <laughs> <laughs> but we say sorry a lot. But something I learned when we moved to New York is the people said Canadians are rude. Have you ever heard that, Canadians are rude? I had never heard that before as a general thing, saying, Alex, you've traveled down to the States, but... Talk about the French Canadians, not, not that we're gonna slam them, there, but the opinion of them down there, as a, that could be one, but there was a different reason why they thought the Canadians were rude. The reason they thought Canadians were rude is because cross-border shoppers would go to the department stores and the big box stores and they would buy clothes. They would come out in the parking lot, they would strip down to their underwear, put their new clothes on, and dump their clothes in the parking lot because there was no garbage cans to put their clothes in. They just leave them laying there. They, they thought that was pretty rude. And that seems pretty rude for me. See, people were trying to avoid the, the customs fees. When they crossed the border, they would throw out the old clothes 
and put on the new clothes. But some people, what they would do is they weren't prepared to do away with the old clothes. They put clothes on top of clothes. Now, I have no idea how you go shopping for clothes that fit and get them over top of every other uh, clothes. <laughs> Any clothes that I wear, there's one layer and that's it. That's all that's going to fit this body. But there's other people too that says, ah, oh, no, the border agent, the border agent's going to be able to tell I've got new clothes and I bought them down here. They, so what they do is they go out in the parking lot, they take off their old clothes, they put on their new clothes, and then they put their old clothes back on, thinking in their mind, the border agent's never going to know that I got three shirts and two pair of pants on <laughs> as they go there. But you know, we laugh at that. We think that's pretty funny that people would think that way, that they could take off their clothes and put on different clothes and they could even put old clothes back on. But you know what? What some people do in the physical realm, I think sometimes we can be guilty of doing in the spiritual realm. What some people do in the physical realm, we can be guilty of doing that in the physical realm. As a part of our re reading today, we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 4, and in the 22nd and 24th verses, it says there, you were taught with regard to your former life to put off the old self and put on the new self. But what some of us sometimes do, we put off the old self, put on the new self, then we want to put the old self back on again. It was kind of comfortable to us. We like to do that. So let's spend some time now looking at Ephesians chapter 4. For the first few months, we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jack Matheson, he preached a message from the first half of this book where he talked about in the first half of that book about how we need to work as one unit. The church is one to be brought together as one unit and we need to have patience. We need to be humble. We need to be encouraging of one another. We need to be gentle with one another. So he's talking to them collectively. But as we come here to verse 17 of chapter 4, he's, Paul is now writing in an individual basis. He's writing to individual believers. And as I've commented before, the letter of Ephesians is what they consider an open letter. What is written to the Ephesians can apply to Christians of any time, in any age, in any place. It's not just apply, applicable to Christians in Ephesus, but it can be applicable to even to us some 2,000 years later on the other side of the world. So Jeffrey, if you could, could you please read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through to the end of the chapter. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardenings of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must, no, must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hand, own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Thank you, Jeffrey. This is the word of God. Paul is saying here that we need to be like some Canadian shoppers. We need to put off the old, and we need to put on the new. But don't put the old back on. He talks about putting off the old. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to us about putting off the old, some of the things that we need to put off, taking it straight from the text and look at some of the things that we need to put on. Putting off the old self, putting on the new self. So first we're going to talk about the old self. Paul writes in verse 17 here, he says he insists in the Lord of what he's writing here, that, that, that his followers of Jesus 
we must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, what he meant there was don't live like the rest of the world. As a person who identifies yourself as a follower of Jesus, as a person who, who, who identifies yourself as someone tr who trusts in Jesus, you must live different than the world lives. And he talks about some of the things that were your, character, your characteristics beforehand, you need to put those off. The first thing he talks about here in verse 17, I call futile thinking. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now we might look at it and say, well, we don't really think in the futility, uh, of, have futility to our thinking. We're pretty straight thoughts. But when, when this word was used, it was meant that they did the same thing over and over again and got the same results. Someone has des described it as insanity uh, as doing that, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It's been attributed to Albert Einstein as far as the one who, who said that, although that's not proven uh, definitely that it was him who said it, but doing the same thing, futility of your mind. Now we can say, I don't think like that. But you know, I think we do think like that from time to time. See, a number of years ago, I took some training in sharing my faith with a method of evangelism called the Evangelism Explosion. Is anybody familiar with the Evangelism Explosion? A couple of you are somewhat familiar. In Evangelism Explosion, they, 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 they teach you that when you, as you're sharing your faith, there's two diagnostic questions that you should answer that you could ask people to prompt them spiritually. One is, if you were to die tonight or today, would you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And it's either a yes or no answer. Then the second question would be, if you were to stand before God and he was asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? Why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? And do you know the answer I got the most and was shared the most? I've tried my best. I'm not a real bad person. I'm not a real good person, but I've tried my best. Do you know what that is? Futile thinking. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the church, outside of the church, or no matter where it is. Many people say, I hope I get into heaven. God should let me into heaven because I tried my best. Do you know why we should get into heaven? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. That's why we should get. God doesn't care what we've done for him. God doesn't care what we've done for others. Yes, he does care, if I put it that way. But it doesn't have an impact on whether we we get to spend eternity with him or not. What matters is that we have trusted in Jesus Christ, we have faith in Jesus Christ, and we follow Jesus Christ uh, to be in a restored relationship with him. And so, in a sense, it's futile thinking when we think, if we keep thinking, well, I'm just doing my best, I'm just doing my best. Your best isn't good enough, bad news. But what is good news is God has already paid the price for not having done, 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 done it perfectly. If you can only do your best, it's not perfect, but God has paid the price to the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, the second thing, that, and it, this is what a futile thinking leads to, it leads to darkened understanding. Their darkened understanding they need to get rid of in verse 18. Futile thinking leads to darkened understanding. Our futile thinking darkens us as to what God desires for us. I have heard so many people that I would talk to to talk about God. And they usually begin their comment with, well, I think. Well, I think. Do you know what would happen if I was, in, I was writing an exam and I began it with, I think? <laughs> What's your thinking based on? Is it based on what you know? Or is it based on just what you think, what you feel? And most often, people who would express an opinion about God and how God is, they wouldn't even have read the Bible before. So part of me would say, well, then how would you know who God is? How would you know what God does? How would you know what God doesn't do? How would you know anything about God? It comes to darkened understanding of who God is. And darkened understanding leads to hardened hearts. Due to their hardening of their hearts, he continues in verse 18. Every time we resist doing what we know in our hearts and our minds that God wants us to do, do you know what happens? Our hearts get a little harder towards it. Our hearts get a little harder towards it. Do you know that heart disease is the number two disease in Canada, the number one disease in the United States? The number one disease in Canada is cancer. Number two is heart disease. But you know what? Heart disease doesn't just happen. It's not like you wake up one morning and you say, hmm, better see the doctor. I think I got some heart disease. Heart disease happens gradually. And that's exactly 
what happens here with heart disease, spiritual heart disease. Their hearts start to grow hard because they slip and they step a little bit at a time. Someone has once said, we don't fall into sin, we slide into sin. We step into sin, we take one step at a time as we do that. And every step we take towards that of doing what God doesn't want us to do, and we know in our hearts and our minds that God doesn't want us to do it, our hearts begin to harden and our hearts continue and gradually they become completely hard. They become completely dysfunctional. And when that happens, a hardened heart can lead to callousness. It talks there about ha having lost all sensitivity. They, they have given themselves over to sensuality so, so as to indulge in every kind of purity. They become callous people. See, a darkened thinking leads to a hardened heart, leads to a calloused a callous will. And a callous will is, I don't know about something. A callous will is, will is, I know about something, but I don't care. I don't care. I know I'm being disobedient to God, but I don't care. Now we might say, well, I never, I don't feel like that. And we, we could look at it. But you know what? If we allow our hearts to get hardened, we can't start to feel like that. And the, the trouble is, is it's not like all of a sudden one day we're going to say, I don't care about God. It's a gradual step towards it that we follow into that. And, and look what, what callousness will eventually lead to as it leads there. You indulge in every kind of impurity. You indulge in every kind of way that would be uh, opposed to what God would desire for you. You indulge. You, in the word there that was used as indulge meant greed. In other words, you're greedy for the things that aren't good for you. You're greedy for the things that God doesn't desire for you. When you're greedy for something, you really want it bad. You want it at all costs, almost. And you become greedy within that. But then it talks there in, in verse 22 about deceitful desires. Put off your old self, which is corrupted by its deceitful desires. You see, our selves tell us, I want this. I find pleasure in that. And do you know what? We do find pleasure, temporary pleasure not permanent pleasure that God, God offers us. As we, we, we see that, we have deceitful desires. Our desires tell us we want it. Our desires tell us that it's good, but they're deceiving us. It's only good for us for a certain amount of time. Or sometimes it's not even good for us, period. Sometimes it's not even good for us, period. And as we put off the old self, we are able to put away those desires that are our desires. We pray, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's desiring God's wills, not desiring our will that we have it here. But it also says there in verse 25 that you're to put off falsehood. And I'll talk about more of that in a moment when I talk about putting on a new self, when I talk about the importance of putting off falsehood and speaking the truth to one another. But it talks there as well in verse 28 about laziness. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, work at doing something useful with their own hands. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But simply to say that the greed, the greed that I spoke about earlier, greed is a part of stealing. That when we do that, when we're, we become lazy, we're, we're, we're too lazy to work for something, so we steal it. We want something and we're lazy to work for it, so we end up stealing it. And that's what greed does to us as well. And it says that the final thing that I'm going to highlight to us, and there's so many things within these verses, but the final thing I ha highlight to us that we need to take off when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and we need to take off is bitterness. We need to take off bitterness. In verse 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 tells us that the seed of bitterness is the cause of much evil. The seed of bitterness, the seed of bitterness, the root of bitterness affects many people. If we become bitter people, it doesn't just affect us it affects others as well. And I can tell you from over uh, many, many years of being a pastor, when I've met people that have been hurt, when I've met people that are hurting, there's usually a time that you can come and you can minister to that. But when someone becomes bitter, it's very hard to get through to a bitter person. It's very hard to comfort a bitter person. It's hard to care for a bitter person. Hurt people hurt people. And I find that many people who become bitter, they hurt other people. Regardless of whatever reason they've allowed it to go to the place where they're hurt, to transition to, to, to bitterness. And we'll talk a bit, bit, bit in a moment of what, why that can happen. But if the hurt transitions to bitterness, it's a very difficult thing to get over. It's a very hard thing to get over. 
How many of you remember that show? Maybe it's still on. I just watched so little TV, I didn't catch it. Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Do you remember that show, Extreme Makeover Home Edition? I had the privilege of uh, participating in that show when they did one of their filmings in Buffalo. What they did is, uh, when that show first started over, they would take a house and they would basically just renovate it. But finally, what they found it was best to do is just knock the place right down and start over again, okay? And they typically build a new one. Well, the one that was done in Buffalo, they built one new house, but they went in the whole neighborhood around the block and they did a lot of other cosmetic work as well. I worked on the house next door to the house, well, I worked on the house that was being built, but on the house next door, I worked on it, and we resided the house, but do you know what it was? It was like lipstick on a pig. You can dress a pig up all you want, but you know what? It's still a pig. And what they did is they took that house to make it look better and just put siding over top of it without stripping the house down properly and putting it on properly. They made lipstick look like a pig. But it, the, the show has found that it's better to get rid of the old and just do it new. Just do it new. Have you ever done a renovation job and found out you've got more headache than if you'd just done it from scratch and done a new job? We do that all the time. We're in the midst of a bathroom renovation at the house. And sometimes I think it, this would be a whole lot easier if we were doing it brand new, like from scratch. You didn't have to undo what was done 50 years ago. One of the things that we found, we, we tore the drywall off. I shouldn't say we, I'm flattering myself. Lorene tore the drywall off the walls. <laughs> and you know what? The old medicine cabinets, they used to have a slot in them. Did you know what that slot was for? Putting straight razor blades down. There was like 30 razor blades behind the drywall between the studs, and apparently that was a common practice back then. I read about that about six months ago, and I, I thought, no, I don't, never heard of that before. And lo and behold, we took this wall apart, and there's razor blades stuck in that wall. It's better to get out with the old and just bring with the new. So I want to talk about some of the, the new stuff that we need to put on. When we look at uh, verse 23 here, it says, be made... Be made new in the attitude of your minds. We need to put on a renewed mind. One of the things we need to put on as a follower of Jesus is a renewed mind. Romans chapter 12, verse, tw chapter 12, verse 2 says there, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. As your mind is changed, your mind controls your actions. Not your action controlling your mind, but first you think it, then you do it. Well, unless we're talking and you're like me it comes out of my mouth before it goes through my brain usually not usually but sometimes it can come out that quick but typically actions follow our thought process and the renewing of your mind will control your actions that you have within that but as the attitude of our mind is renewed there are two key things that will happen as verse 24 points this out to us put on the new self it says there in verse 24 to be created created to be like God in true righteousness. I define righteousness as a, a kind of a church and ease word, a, church, a word that we use generally only in church. Righteousness is rightness with God, being right with God, being in a restored relationship with God. And that comes as a result of having a renewed mind leads to that righteousness. Righteousness means that we become right with God, we become acceptable God. And how do we do that? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we become right with God. And through the work of Jesus, we are made righteous, we are made acceptable with God, but we're also made holy. You see, when we come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God sees us as fully holy. God sees us as fully, sorry, fully righteous. We're right standing before him. Now, if I look at myself and I say, I'm not, who, who of us here would say, I'm 100% righteous? Anyone? How many would say I'm less than 100% righteous? All of us. We're less than 100% righteous. But through Christ, God sees us through Christ and he sees us as righteous. What holiness is, is building us more into that image that he already sees us as. He sees us as righteous. Some of us have heard the word sanctification. It's a sanctification process that goes on where we, we are becoming more holy. We are standing in there. So it says there, put on the new self, created in God, to be like God in righteousness and holiness. We're created to be that way, in righteousness and holiness, as we see there. But then, verse 25 also says, speak truthfully 
to your neighbor. Talks about sharing, putting on truth, taking off falsehood that we talked about before, but putting on truth. <clears throat> Lying destroys unity, falsehood destroys trust. Paul's been speaking in Ephesians here about unity, about the body being one, the many parts coming together of the body being one and being truthful with one another. That's what he shares here. Now, why is that? Well, think of your own physical body. Our physical body works properly when the, the, the nerves send proper signals to the brain and the brain sends proper signals to where they need to be and the, function, the, the body can function properly. But what would happen if the nerves sent a signal to the brain that said something hot was cold, the body wouldn't function. But it's telling its lies. The, the nerves would be telling the brain a lie and the body wouldn't function too well. Well, it's the same when we function as the body of Christ. Many parts, all of us are different parts, brought together. And if we start being untruthful with one another, we're sending false signals with one another, how can a body function properly? And so Paul says here, you need to put on truth because you are a unit, you are a body of that. He also says in verses 26 and 27, which I summarize there is, put on self-control. Put on some self-control. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. You see here, he's not saying here, don't be angry. What's he saying? When you are angry, don't lose control. Don't lose control with that. Do not sin with that. We can think of Jesus himself. He went into the temple and he saw the money changes and he saw the way they were acting. In anger, he tipped those tables. He didn't lose control. He knew what he was doing the whole time. He had control of himself, but he had anger. And Paul is saying here that if we are in anger, don't sin. And he gives a remedy how to, how to control that. Have you ever had trouble controlling your anger? I can remember, well, more than once. Uh, but I can remember once when my children were little and I was putting them in the vehicle and we had an eight passenger window van and I thought I'll never have to worry about the kids worrying about what window they get, what seat they get. Do you know what? They always wanted the same seat as each other. They always wanted the same window as one another. And I can remember one day we put them into the vehicle and they were being typical four and five year olds and I shouldn't say fighting, but just bickering with each other. Who gets to sit where? Uh, and I was losing it. I was losing it. I said, Lord, Lord, one, two, three. I was counting. And I thought, here's what I'll do. I'll walk to the mailbox. We had the, the, the group mailboxes on the street. And by the time I get back, it'll be settled. You know what? By the time I get back, it wasn't settled. And do you know how I handled it? <laughs> I just blew up. I, I, I lost it. God says, it's okay to be anger, but don't lose control of that. Don't sin in that. And in that instant, I remembered that I sinned. But God says, there's Peter, Paul says here, there's something you can do to help control that. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In a marriage relationship, so often we can let a small problem become a big problem. Do you know why? because we sleep on it. We go to bed and let, let the problem continue into the next day and into the next day, then the next week, then the next month. And then it continues on and continues to fester. And P, Paul, Paul says here, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Try and resolve the problem. And as the Bible tells us, as much as it's possible, not that it's always possible, but as, as much as it is possible, live at peace with others. Live at peace with others as we do that. Well, here's something else that he suggests here in verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. We need to put on a work ethic. We need to put on a quit being lazy and put on a work ethic. You know, it's amazing what people would do and the lengths that people would go to because they're lazy. Even too lazy to buy their own food, the food that they want, the first church I served at was in a small, smaller town in Manitoba, and we had a, uh, a local grocery store. The manager of the store, he attended our church, and he told me, you'd be amazed at what people would steal in the stores. Like, people would get a bag of potatoes, they'd open a bag of potatoes, dump out the potatoes, and put steaks inside the bag, and seal the bag up. Why? Because they're too lazy to go out and earn the money to pay for the steaks. And here, it's interesting what, what he points out here when he, when he says this. He says, why should you be going out and working and earning something? Not just for yourself, 
but that they may have something to share with those in need. I loved your testimony, Tabitha, when you shared. You got 50 bucks. That's wonderful. And what did you feel led to do inside you? Give it to someone else. Help someone else out. Whether you didn't know what their need was or even if they had a specific need. But to share it with others. Do you know what happens when we start sharing with others? We take our minds off ourselves. We take our minds off ourselves and we start thinking about others. So that helps us in our time with that. But the other, another thing that it suggests here for us in verse 29, it talks about we need to put on speech. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful to build others up and according to their needs, that, that it may be a benefit to those who listen. Not only is it for the person who receives those words of encouragement, but anyone who listens. Anyone who listens. Those people on the outskirts, if you can call it, they listen to hear it. Do you know what I call this? I call this mom's golden rule, and you're going to finish this for me. If you don't have anything good to say, I didn't know we were in the same family. No wonder I didn't see my mom that often. You were, she was at your place. <laughs> yeah, if you've got nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. Do you ever find that hard? Do you ever find that hard? Who, who remembers that TV show, Cheers? A number of people. I, I, that, that was the one in Boston, right, at the bar? Yeah, okay, Cheers. Do you know what? The Lord convicted my heart that I had to stop watching Cheers. Nothing wrong with it. You do what you want. But for me, I had to stop watching. Do you know why? Because of Carla. Do you remember Carla? The short, little, mouthy girl that was on there? What she would do is she would feed me. She had a cynical, sarcastic uh, attitude with her, and it would feed my cynical, sarcastic side. And I found it difficult to be positive, speaking to others. When it talks to you here about letting unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, lots of unwholesome talk would come out of my mouth after watching that. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Mark, quit watching that. It's not doing you any good. How can you expect to be putting on a new when you're sticking that old in there? And it's happening. And sometimes we need to listen to the Lord. And what is he saying to us? He's saying, get rid of the old. Put the new one. And a part of that new is speech. And finally, in verse 32, we see that we need to put on forgiveness. Be kind and compassion, compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. The reason we forgive is because we've been forgiven. The reason we forgive we forgive us because we've been forgiven. You know what? It's easy me, for me to right now to look at Putin and think, what a wicked man he is, and he is. But you know what? Apart from Christ, I'm just as separated from God. Apart from Christ, I am just as separated from God. And I need to realize that. I need to be willing to forgive others because I also have been forgiven. If you can't forgive, they will only try to but if you don't forgive someone, I heard someone say, it's like letting them live in your head, rent free. Like letting someone live in your head. And something I've discovered, forgiveness is never dependent on the other person asking for it. If, I'm not saying the other person shouldn't be forgiven. I'm not saying they shouldn't ask for it, but it shouldn't be dependent on it. It's easy, you, you, not, not it's easy, it's very difficult. But you need to be willing to forgive. You need to be a forgiving person. Your attitude of forgiveness needs to exist long before you need, need to come to that occasion when you need to forgive. Your attitude of forgiveness needs to be there long before the occasion arises that you need to forgive. If someone hurts you, you already need to have a forgiving spirit within you. Forgiveness is never dependent on the person. Well, I'll only forgive you if you ask for forgiveness. It's not that the offending party needs to make restitution. It's not that the offending party doesn't need to ask for forgive, forgiveness in that. But your attitude of forgiveness must be there in advance. Seeing as we're talking about TV shows today, do you remember that show? And I maybe it's still on. I don't know. What not to wear? Did anyone ever see that show? What not to wear? Yeah, well, at least one of us watched all of those cool shows. Uh, it was a show where people who, their friends would apparently get hold of the show and say, my friend dresses ridiculously, and I want you to give them a makeover, like redo their wardrobe sort of thing. 
And at the end of the show, they would look at it and say, now comparison, and, and, and almost always, if not always, the person who got the new wardrobe would see the improvement. It was a better me. And they would be asked, what would ever possess you to wear those clothes you used to wear? And you know what would often be said to them? They said, I just like the way it feels. I like the fit of it. It makes me feel comfortable. We're to put off the old self. Sometimes the old self makes us feel comfortable. But God says to us, we're to put on the new self. We're to come and put the new self on that he will put on us and he will transform us into. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you just didn't come and spruce us up a bit. You just didn't come and make a new model sort of thing or renovate us or something like that. You've come to make us new. And as Paul has written here to the Ephesians and as we here have here for us today that we are to put off the old and put on the new. But sometimes, Father, we, we putting on the new, we, we like to pick and choose what we put on and what we don't put on. Oh, I like this, I don't like that. And then sometimes we find ourselves falling in that trap where we, where we put the old clothes back on. I was comfortable in those. I like how I felt when I wore those. But Father, let us feel comfortable in what you have for us and the things that we need to put on. In every aspect of this, Father, would you give us the strength? Would you give us the ability through your Holy Spirit working in us and your Holy Spirit working through us to put on the new self and do away with the old self, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's sing once more in response to the message. Holy Spirit, take control. Fill my life, satisfy this thirsting soul. Holy Spirit, I am dry. Fill me to overflow. With love, joy, and peace. Patience, kindness, good. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, fill me to overflow. Holy Spirit, take control, fill my life, satisfy this thirsting soul. Holy Spirit, I am dry, fill me to overflow, with love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Fill me to overflow. As we sing that song, it's not about trying to put on the new stuff yourself, trying self-improvement. It's about letting God have control. It's about less of you, less of me, and more of him. Hold your hands up, receive this blessing. May God bless you, may God keep you, may God shine his face upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>